It is my absolute delight to welcome Ms. Namrata Goswami and Mr. Peter Garrison, authors of Scramble for the Skies, to the National Security Space Institute here in Colorado. Welcome and thank you both so much for taking the time to speak to our faculty and our students as part of our speaker series and for joining me here today to uh, have a fireside chat and share some of the insight that you've given us in person with our wider space community. The premise of your book is that the resources in space are likely to be the next ground fought over by terrestrial great powers but with middle powers having significant influence over how this is conducted. A comparison being with the race for the colonies in the 17th and 18th century and the conquering of the high seas. He who got there first got the power and got the wealth. Can you tell us why you wrote this book? Well, for me, my motivation was really that I had seen within sort of the new space community and expert space community a long and involved discussion on the importance of potential impact of space resources and none of that had really penetrated uh, national security thinking or international relations scholarship. And so the book in part was to bridge that to be able to provide a, a meaningful and defendable bridge that this is in fact happening and that it's something that is worthy of consideration by international relations scholars and national security strategists and planners. Yeah, I think uh, the basic rationale for why we wrote the book is that, uh, so before we proposed the idea to the Minerva uh, Research Initiative uh, for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, we did an extensive literature survey looking at books on space and looking at whether those books had actually captured the uh, emerging conversations, for example, within China on space resources, how they were viewing space differently. And once we did that literature survey, what we realized was that there was not a single book that actually brought those two different factors together, space resources, grand strategy, and the futuristic perspective that some of these countries were having. And so we thought that our book and our research would actually fill a gap in the literature. And just, you know, the other thing I would say is that it appeared to be such a hole in, uh, in thinking particularly, um, you know, among the free nations uh, that they weren't really uh, focused on this, that you saw in particular a very strong focus in China and that if this was in fact an emerging area of competition, it was something that really deserved uh, attention and scrutiny. Multiple organizations, including the NSSI, have recognized your book's value to the space community. Can you tell us what key lessons you wish, you wish to convey? So I think the key lessons, uh, we can divide them into three different facets, right? So one of the lessons would be for the uh, academic community. So the book had different target audiences. One was that the academic community, uh, the biggest lesson to be drawn was that International relations scholarship and theory needs to account for changing policy realities to reflect back and think through what that means for a country's national interest, uh, national security, or grand strategy. So one lesson was for the academic community. And I think we have succeeded to an extent because I see the book being included in different courses around the country and the world. Uh, including graduate studies. The second lesson that I thought the book very clearly pointed out was that in terms of just policy conversations, it's really important to keep in mind how another country's strategic culture or perspective might differ. I would argue that sometimes China does not understand U.S. strategic culture. We always say that U.S. doesn't understand, right? Or India doesn't understand you know, U.S. strategic culture. So that was one of the lessons for the policy community because we have a chapter on strategic culture. And then the final lesson was that when you think about space and space policy research, this is a very long-term investment. Space technology capacity is something that needs long-term investment. And so what is very heartening for us is that the book has a resonance in the industry community. So I have a lot of folks from industry who have read the book and find it useful for the kind of work they're doing. So those are the three lessons. I would say, uh, first and foremost, that the, uh, that the competition for space resources will matter to the future of power and that, it, uh, that a nation state that expects to be important in the future international system 
has to pay attention to space resources or you know it will uh, miss out on the future wealth of nations and that because the wealth of nations is intimately connected with uh, military power and balance of power considerations in the international system, it can't be ignored by anyone. It can't be ignored uh, by state departments or, uh, or ministries of state. It can't be ignored by uh, space forces or military space personnel. And it certainly can't be ignored by national security planners. You discuss several nations in your book, including the US, China, United Arab Emirates, India and Luxembourg. Notably missing from this list is Russia. Can you explain the rationale behind this? Well, I, I think there were a couple important rationales, and I'll, I'll let Namrata talk about hers. But on my end, our book tried to cast a, a, you know, a net out pretty far. And so when, you, when we were sort of assessing where we thought uh, economics and power was likely to go in the absence of space resources out to 2050, uh, Russia is, is no longer anticipated to be in the top 10 uh, world economies. And so, you know, we, we uh, really wanted to, you know, you can't cover everybody in the book, and there are other interesting space powers as well, and both existing and emerging. Uh, but, you know, when you looked at the top three, the top three economies in 2050 um, are anticipated to be uh, China, India, and the United States, uh, and, and most... Uh, most forecasts agree that those will be the top three, but forecasts will uh, differ as to what the order of those three will be. And since, you know, Russia was not going to be clearly among them, we figured that over the period of time from here to 2050, uh, you know, very likely, uh, you know, India would raise in prominence as a space power and, and Russia would likely decline. Yeah, so I think uh, following what Peter said, I think the one of the uh, important methodology we uh, adopted for the book was fieldwork. And so while we could do fieldwork in the other nations, uh, Russia was a challenge at the time. And so uh, that was a major reason for not including Russia. Uh, I hope to include Russia in the book that I'm writing. And so hopefully we'll fill that particular gap because Russia, after all, despite uh, not being in the top tier will still play a major role in how international relations and system is uh, constituted. For the US specifically, what do you believe are the greatest challenges to consider and overcome? Well, I think the United States is hampered by its past success. So because the United States space program came of age in a time uh, of, the, of the first Cold War, its experience and the way it thinks about space tends to either put it sort of in the strategic and nuclear category or to put it sort of in the prestige and first category. And so I think uh, uh, Americans ac across the board, whether it's in the general electorate or whether it's in uh, policy making, um, have these preconceived paradigms with which they try to interpret the world. And I think um, they're going to be increasingly mismatched. That those those paradigms don't reflect uh, the emerging economic power of space and the importance of focusing uh, both civil, uh, civil and national security programs on the development of commerce and trade and resources. Um, and then, you know, as a result, I think that we have uh, we've focused very tactically. So, you know, if you look at NASA's program, it's, it's sort of focused on a recreation. The narrative is very much sort of a recreation of, the, of Apollo, of you know, putting people down somewhere as a, as a feat, uh, you know, a feat of, of national greatness, um, which is quite distinct from what they were actually tasked with, which was building an industrial capability on the moon for, for sustained uh, presence after 2028. And then on the Space Force side, I think that we've been captured by this very tactical narrative of concern over anti-satellite weapons. And if you read our book, there's this whole separate narrative that was going on in the executive and Congress about the, the importance of space resources and the need to be able to protect that over time you know, with something that might more approximate a Navy. So I think one of the challenges will be overcoming the, uh, the, the cultural bias 
that the Space Force has inherited from Air Force Space Command of thinking of itself purely as a joint warfighting support force and bridging to the much vaster canvas of the space domain as a theater of competition itself and the need to prepare itself for a much larger mission set to both defend and help deliberately expand the, the basis for, for U.S. and allied power in the space domain. I think uh, one of the biggest challenge for the United States in the post-Cold War period is to find a strategic vision. So it, the U.S. has been distracted in the uh, post-Cold War period with wars in the Middle East, which are subconventional mostly. Uh, and so to, uh, it, it doesn't have the same kind of Cold War systemic competition, right, uh, which it had during the Cold War, which gave the society a focus of why the United States needs to maintain leadership. But today, because uh, of that long period of losing that systemic framework, and then suddenly rising up to a challenge, which is that uh, U.S. Uh, capability to maneuver has come down because of the rise of China. And uh, I argue that that is relative balance of power. So uh, China's ability to influence uh, international systemic frameworks, its role in the United Nations, its ability to forge uh, partnerships with countries that are historically U.S. allies, have actually uh, challenged the confidence of the United States in terms of building a leadership. So I think generally, from a grand strategic sense, you can see that play out in the world. In terms of space itself, uh, I think uh, the United States uh, has not recognized, and I think this is going to be a big challenge, that uh, the discourse on space is not what it was during the Cold War. I don't think the strategic community has woken up to that as yet. There's a lot of denial of uh, China's uh, changing of the discourse. There's denial about the fact that China has actually done feats that the U.S. never thought they would. And I think that has created strategic blindness in a sense. And I think that is a big challenge. And the final challenge is mirror imaging. So mostly the U.S., uh, when I talk to the strategic community, there is an assumption that China would behave exactly as the U.S. has behaved in space, that uh, it will follow legal treaties, laws. Uh, once it signs onto the Outer Space Treaty, it would tend to behave in a very regulatory way. And then when it doesn't, uh, there is again strategic surprise. So I think those are the challenges. It's interesting that you mention alliances. What kind of alliances do you see emerging or potentially fracturing as the scramble for the skies unfolds? So, you know, as Namrata mentioned, you know, there are many things that are distinct about uh, this strategic competition from the Cold War. And one of them is that, uh, you know, China is so much more embedded in a common system than the Soviet Union was and is so much uh, so much stronger in, in just about every way. They're stronger economically, they're stronger in terms of their uh, STEM uh, capability, and they're much stronger in terms of their international uh, presence. But one of the things that I think is very similar between the two is that the great powers uh, always have to compete for coalitional alignment. Uh, of all the other nations that, you know, it, it's a common playing field where, you know, there's an audience that the two powers are playing to in order to get folks, you know, on side to align with, you know, their, their wolf pack uh, or, you know, leadership within, you know, a, a single wolf pack. And so, um, you know, this is going to continue to be in play and, and China um, has a lot of attractive things that they can put forward because of the size of their economy, because of their ability to open access to that, because of their very, very concerted push to provide um, upgrades to infrastructure and information tech systems, which they're now knitting into. So, you know, the United States needs to realize that it is in a very serious competition, and that includes what, you know, some have called the ground-based space race, that, you know, that part of the competition is who's going to build alliances, and that's not just in, in sort of political affinity, but that's 
who's buying whose hardware, who's locking into which sets of standards of infrastructure, who's sort of being knitted into the pattern of the other. So on the one hand, I think that you know, we're likely to see uh, enduring alliances in the transatlantic community, in, in the Five Eyes, sort of in the, in the larger you know, uh, remnants of the, of the British Commonwealth abroad, uh, which I would include India as, as likely uh, to be moving closer. And that sort of gets into the other, you know, in, on the Pacific side, I think you know, the Quad, maybe the Quad, uh, which, which would be you know, the United States, India, uh, Japan, and Australia, and you know perhaps also eventually including uh, South Korea, those are likely to, to remain uh, increasingly important. And then you know in play, I think you're going to see some states in sort of maybe you know southern eastern Europe, uh, although some you know are, are going to move more clearly uh, towards the transatlantic community. And then uh, Africa and parts of the Middle East, I think, are going to be in play. And it won't be, you know, it, it will be very difficult to draw very clear distinctions because these nations have agency. You know, they're going to try as best they can to play both sides. Um, and to some extent, that's also a good news story because their desire to keep the gravy train running, to be able to uh, make the both of uh, both sides, will uh, tend to moderate conflict and will you know, force each side to try to you know, provide a better deal for, for that area. But that area you know, is also a, a terrific nexus for space resources because in many cases this is, this is the center of current uh, development, economic development on Earth, and those are exactly the nations that are most in need of the sorts of uh, mineral and energy resources that space could provide to make the world a, a much wealthier place. So very likely the space race um, or the scramble for the skies is going to um, uh, accelerate our ability to make the world a, a richer place uh, provided that conflict does not spill over. And even if conflict does happen, I think it's quite important to realize that the, you know, the, the dominant paradigm that national security planners may need to have is, is one of more Cold War economic style competition. You know, it is certainly possible, you know, that a limited or, or large uh, conflict could happen in space, but it's almost certain that you're going to have skirmishes and attempts at coercion at the extreme ends of your logistics systems. And you're also going to have a continual competition to build, you know, sort of economic and industrial strength at the far reaches of that. And you know, a, a, a space force that's not postured to think about and facilitate that will fail uh, the United States and the broader allied system. So if I think about your question, uh, it's really interesting because uh, which alliance will endure and which alliances might fracture. So I think uh, the alliances that will endure as we see what the response to the Russian invasion in Ukraine and I think that's where Russia miscalculated, was that uh, the European Union and countries in Europe actually got together and became even more unified. So a similar situation can play out, for example, on the moon, right? So if you have a Russia-China research station on the moon and they create a non-interference zone and does not allow, for example, a private company from, say, the European Union or supported by European Space Agency to land there, I think that will bring about unified response, right, both at a regional level and at the level of the United Nations. I think the interesting strategic question is, will this alliances fracture? I think what China has done, and which is very interesting to me, is that it's not just fracturing, it's actually creating uncertainty for alliances to actually behave in a way that they are singularly focused on achieving a particular goal, right? And so uh, think about the responses to the South China Sea, think about the responses, uh, China's behavior in Antarctica. Despite the fact that uh, countries within a particular alliance system understands what the long-term strategic impact of that is. They also make calculations in terms of Chinese economic interest, Chinese investments, and so 
the, the ability for alliances to actually achieve singular goals when their own interests are at stake is going to get limited because they have very strong economic connections to a particular nation, supply chains, uh, medical supplies. It's a big, it's really an important calculation. Finally, I'll argue that if you look at the response to Russia itself and Russia's invasion, even a country like India has abstained from actually uh, not coming out very openly, right? And I think the U.S. today is not constituted to understand such behavior. So the U.S. strategic framework is to basically look at the world as either you're with us or you're with them, right? And what that does is that a nation like India, which has historical uncertainties, uh, a different framing of how the world is, and also a different middle um, a kind of influence on Russia, which actually I thought the U.S. could have used it to its advantage to reach out to Putin, which the U.S. did not because of this framing. And I think that kind of framing, which is so black and white, can sometimes not work out when you think about space resources as well, right? For example, the inability to get India to sign the Artemis Accords, right? India is the largest democracy. And so why is that? It's because, again, that framing, right? And also it's very nationalistic. And so I think that could fracture alliances in the long term and, and limit the ability to respond to a particular situation in space in a unified manner. And uh, if you look at the UN voting pattern, you see that play out with the Russian invasion as well. Countries in Africa have abstained and have refused to condemn uh, Russia's invasion. Russia is able to use that to its advantage. There's a completely different narrative out there. If you look at African news media, uh, if you look at uh, association of uh, uh, Southeast Asian nations. Uh, in fact, they again refused to condemn Russia. So, yeah. It sounds like there is a soft power consideration to be had here that um, perhaps the US is misunderstanding how to utilize its soft power and that they need to have a better understanding of different countries' perspectives. Yeah, I think it needs a much more complex understanding of that nation's interests. It's all calculations, right? Cost and benefit. And so if you want to have a particular country, for example, you want to have the ASEAN nations take a stand on, say, a space resource uh, issue. I think it's so critical to understand what their constraints are and then work within those constraints, constraints and their system, which means that you will have to have very deep level expertise on understanding why they are behaving in that manner. And so I think it, this will play out in space as well. Uh, you already see it playing out, including the conversation around regulation for space resource utilization, right? China is leading it in terms of changing the frame. But you see so much resistance within the US uh, policy community to even consider a space resource utilization regulatory framework because there is this push and pull. You know, we have to be, we should do space science, we should do space exploration. We cannot use words like space utilization. NASA would argue that we cannot even use that term. We can only use space exploration. Think about how much uh, conceptual conversation you're missing out because you're even unwilling to go there. And you are the country's lead space agency. So I think there is, a, there is that possibility of fractured uh, partnership just because you're not able to have those strategic conversations as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the United States is missing huge soft power uh, potential benefits related to space resources and broader things. You know, if, if you think about it, both within terms of the United States and the United States Space Force specifically, uh, there are certain things that, you know, the world does or, or ought to care about. and. You know, to the extent that the, I mean, it's it's great to offer other nations, you know, a chance to participate in a, a science or, you know, a prestige mission to have their astronauts be part of going to the moon. But that's a very different narrative than, you know, like a, a post-World War II Marshall Plan to, like, build a much broader economic system, right? I mean, the United States has Artemis, but it doesn't really have an organization for economic cooperation and development for cislunar space, right? It, it isn't providing a global wealth platform to uplift the world and provide development. Uh, you know, it's other nations like the UK, like Japan, like China, are investing in space solar power as something to get to net zero carbon. 
uh, despite the you know avowed commitment of this administration you know towards moving us to attacking climate change they haven't asked nasa to focus in any way on on space solar power which conceivably is an arrow in the quiver that could scale to all global demand and i think you know the united states is missing some tremendous soft power and narrative advantages of attempting to pursue a, you know a global space based you know uh, uh, a proposal to move towards uh, net zero through space based energy um, and also when it comes to uh, planetary defense you know here is something that the United States has quietly pioneered but again it's not really offering meaningful international leadership and hasn't asked the Space Force to take on you know as a global public good similarly with debris removal right there's you know we are missing the opportunity I think to to demonstrate why the world should want a space force they should want a space force because it is advancing space solar power because it does provide the ability to you know protect the entire biosphere uh, from dangerous asteroids because it is helping create the fundamental technologies to keep space you know safe by removing debris because it's you know opening uh, the, the vast economic expanse for development and because neither the Space Force leadership, nor the national leadership, nor the NASA leadership frame it in this way, I think they're missing the large vehicle that many nations could see themselves jumping on or see like, wow, that is a responsible use of power. That, that's a, you know, that is a, a, a international leader we should want, or you know, that's an America we should want, or that's a U.S. Space Force that we should want to be playing a role in the world. Yeah, I'll quickly add that uh, it's a very interesting perspective you brought. And so I think uh, what is so interesting, if you think about, okay, the question is, how does another country, for example, view the U.S. Navy patrolling the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, right? And so one of India's very, very famous grand strategists, uh, C. Raja Mohan, who's uh, extremely well respected. So he's written pieces where he's pointed out that the U.S. Navy actually enables so much commerce and so much free lines of commerce for India as well. So this is a global public good that the U.S. Navy provides, and so there is a deep respect for that. And so the U.S. Navy's ability to not only uh, do that, but also to have that strategic narrative of why, uh, freedom of sea lines of communication that allows other countries and enables them to have a prosperous economy, creates a lot of gratitude. And so it's a really interesting strategic narrative, and it's recognized by other nations. And so I think it's a win. You know, so an interesting question is, you know, if, is, is what the Navy provides hard power or soft power? Because, of course, it, it provides an attractiveness. It provides a very stabilizing, you know, sec security uh, type of mindset to many partners that engage on the oceans. Um, and this is, a, this is what I think a meaningful difference between how the, the narrative that is being told by the Navy leadership compared to the, the Space Force leadership. So the Navy, I think, has a very nuanced uh, conversation. I don't think anybody would deny that the Navy is a warfighting service or that the, the, you know, the oceans have seen war and are a warfighting domain. But they don't choose to emphasize that. You know, the, the Navy leadership, you know, talks about how you know, 90% of commerce is on the seas and close to the coasts, and they secure commerce and you know enable this as a as a global public good and as a you know global force for good. Um, you know, whereas the the and so they're not scaring, they're not constantly reminding the merchant marine and everybody else that the sea is a war fighting domain. And I think that gives actors a tremendous amount of confidence that you know the Navy is a very responsible actor committed to the stability of the domain and and, uh, and the importance of commerce um, so I, I think those would be you know a, a valuable lesson for the Space Force leadership to adopt is they should be talking about space in a similar way to how the, the uh, naval services talk about the ocean the two energy sources that you discuss are solar and helium-3. Which do you think will be the most accessible and what kind of impact um, do you think this will have to the balance of power? Yeah, so I, I would think that looking at the case studies, uh, China is interested in both. 
So they're interested in space-based solar power and they're also interested in uh, accessing helium-3 on the moon. And the basic argument, which Wu Wering makes very clear, and he's written, recently published a peer-reviewed piece on this, and he's the head designer of China's lunar program. So he points out that for China to be able to move quickly in space, one technology that needs to be developed is nuclear propulsion and helium-3 is one of the fuels they can use. So that's, that's, and he thinks that that would actually add to China's ability to become a leader in space, which means it'll have impact on the balance of power. And it's a very clear connection in terms of grand strategic thinking. Uh, India, which is uh, the, one of the major Asian nations in space, also is interested in helium-3 for a very long time. Uh, since about 2006, there has been public articulation. And in fact, one of India's former Indian Space Research Organization director, uh, Mr. Kumar, he pointed out that the nation that is actually able to crack the helium-3 extraction capability will be the nation that will become the lead actor, uh, again, influencing the balance of power. So, th so but what is uh, surprising to me is that India's today at least does not have an official program on space-based solar power. Uh, India's former head of state, Abdul Kalam, uh, pushed for this internationally. Uh, he actually uh, came here to the US and gave a very interesting lecture at Boston University and with the National Space Society where he said that uh, democratic nations need to come together to actually invest in this particular technology. But India doesn't have an official program on that as yet. It's in the epistemic community, intellectual community conversations, but has not made it to a policy document or a program? So I think this is a fascinating question. I think you know the real answer is that we don't know. Um, and, and we don't know principally because we, we really have no way to know uh, how quickly or how fast uh, fusion and fusion with helium-3 will arrive. So what's absolutely novel about today is that there are multiple billions of dollars of private money flowing into fusion research that wasn't the case, you know, uh, just certainly not a decade ago, maybe not even, you know, five or six years ago. And what's fascinating about that is that the, the huge levels of private investment in fusion were really a result of SpaceX. So when uh, the uh, venture capital community saw that uh, Elon Musk was able to achieve rocket reusability, uh, that changed their perspective and they said maybe we've been thinking about this wrong um, maybe it, it's not that it's so technically difficult maybe it's just that we've been expecting governments to do something and that they are not as efficient as the private sector and so that has kicked off a huge you know there are probably 10 different fusion startups all with significant funding you know around the world you know quite a few in in Great Britain itself uh, and many here in the United States and Canada now you know, if you can crack fusion, you're still a long way away from being able to use helium-3, which, you know, requires a much greater compression and temperatures to get it uh, started. But if it does, the, the reason why people are excited about helium-3 is that it produces very little neutrons, which are the radiation that is harmful to both people, uh, as well as degrade the, you know, the surrounding material. And so if you can if you can crack helium-3 fusion, it's an especially attractive fuel for uh, really advanced space propulsion. And it's also a very compact fuel source. So like you, you know, you could essentially fill like one space shuttle main tank uh, and bring it back to the Earth and it would like, uh, I forget if it, what exactly it is, but it's some enormous amount of powering, you know, all of North America for a year or something. But, uh, and comparatively, because the moon is outside the Earth's magnetic field that deflects uh, helium-3, um, it embeds itself on the lunar surface. And so it has a relatively high concentration. It's still, you know, a pretty low concentration. Um, but, you know, some folks are thinking even further ahead, they're like, you know, you would use the helium-3 on the moon to enable advanced space propulsion to get you out to the gas giants and that you could actually mine the vast amounts of helium-3 that are in the upper atmospheres of, uh, of you know, some of the more accessible um, gas giants for sort of like a, you can picture like a descending ramjet through to capture it. 
And so, you know, nuclear fusion becomes really important the further out you get. So, you know, obviously, you know, if you have advanced uh, uh, nuclear propulsion, either nuclear thermal or fission fusion, sorry, fission thermal, fission electric, you can get to and from Mars much faster. You can get to and from the asteroid much, belt much faster. And that's one of the reasons China is interested in pursuing uh, uh, nuclear powered spacecraft for asteroid mining. But if you want to do anything ambitious, like have human settlements or the, the type of you know, thing you see in the expanse, uh, you need to have uh, fusion propulsion to get you know, to the edge of the solar system or even beyond it. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I think space solar power is comparatively, you know, it requires no science breakthroughs at all. I mean, it, it's just, you know, it's basically, you know, the p photovoltaic cells like you might have on top of your house, only lighter and more efficient, and uh, phased array antennas like you might have on the front of a fighter plane, um, you know, put up and assembled with rockets and robots that then just beam a, uh, you know, a, a, a radio signal down to the ground that gets reconverted. And the amazing thing about that is how scalable that is. So I don't want to minimize the engineering challenge because it would be like having built your first, um, your first concrete river dam and then saying, hey, let's build the Hoover Dam. You know, these are incredibly massive satellites. You know, the, the largest thing in space today, the International Space Station, is just 300 metric tons. You know, a 10 gigawatt, you know, solar power satellite might be 10,000 metric tons. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously that becomes way more attractive to build with space resources when it's like many, it's like 22 times less energy to get to escape velocity from the surface of the moon than from Earth. So as a logistics space, as a logistics hub, the moon is attractive and even more attractive because you wouldn't even need to use rockets. So, you know, when you launch like a rocket, if you think of like, you know, the, the Saturn V, you know, like 4% of that rocket was payload. On the moon, you know, the same rocket, 50% of it could be payload. But the beauty is because the moon has no atmosphere, you don't have to build things for shaking and vibration. And you can actually just like launch them on electromagnetic catapult like you would off of a modern carrier ship. And so the ability to build those things at scale, you know, this is why it makes sense for the Chinese to be talking about a $10 trillion uh, space economy by industrializing the moon to build solar power satellites. So there's no physics magic to this. It's just a question of organization. It, it's not even a question. There are already, you know, fairly mature systems designs. The real question is organization of capital. You know, can you have a nation state or a group of nations or a sovereign wealth fund or something that can spend, you know, the, uh, the significant amount of money, though not actually more than like developing a major mine, you know, maybe somewhere under a hundred billion, but once that initial capital cost is done, you know, you have a green energy system that can scale to all global demand six times over. So I, I tend to put my money in the near term on, uh, on space solar power. And in the longer term, you know, uh, as we move, you know, past the asteroid belt, you know, on, you know, by then I'm sure we will have cracked helium-3 fusion. That leads me on to a question about space traffic management. With so much discussion around norms and behavior and even disagreement of what those may look like, how do you see uh, different countries in the world, um, potentially through the UN, uh, progressing with space traffic management to allow the civil and commercial um, transition in and through space for lines of uh, commerce and communication? You know, so first of all, I think you're absolutely correct that in a world where you see significant uh, accessing of space resources to create off-Earth industry, off-Earth power, and a limited amount of bringing uh, customized goods to the ground, you're seeing a lot more traffic, um, and a lot more traffic moving up and moving down, and you know traffic that you know at the lowest level is going to interact you know with airspace. So you can imagine that maybe you know some place in Australia or you know Mongolia or Siberia or the ocean is a designated place to receive 
you know, uh, you know uh, re-entry for platinum group metals or, or you know, custom integrated circuits or something that have been you know purchased, and so you'd have to think about your traffic management, you know, through Geo, through Leo, you know, all the way down, you know, through national airspace. On the other hand, you know, certainly your first generation of solar power satellites are going to require, you know, orders of mag magnitude more launch. I mean, you saw, or uh, the students who saw our, our presentation would have seen that, you know, China, for instance, is banking on like 650 launches to build one solar power satellite, heavy launches, right, which is a you know, huge, huge increase over today's. And that's just for one. You know, if you really want to put a dent in climate change, you're going to be building 3,000 of those. So you're talking about millions of metric tons being moved up initially. And then once you have an industrial base on the moon, that's, I would think, going to largely stop. And then you're going to see millions of metric tons coming down from the moon to geo. So you will see, you know, lines of commerce emerge that go from the lunar surface to low lunar orbit or the Earth, the Earth Moon Lagrange point two, and then on to GEO. And then uh, you'll see significant construction in GEO. GEO will continue to remain you know, very important if power develops there, electric power develops there. Um, once that uh, industry is built, you have everything you need to do much more massive endeavors to actually start building these uh, Bezos, O'Neill, uh, and space settlements, these free-flying communities at the L, uh, L4 and L5 point. So then you'll see you know, a line of commerce that runs from the moon probably to L2 and then on to uh, L4, L5. And I would imagine that this, you know, like the Indo-Pacific, is going to see many different nations traversing these lines of commerce. Uh, and on the one hand, I would expect that you would have multiple you know, space navies uh, patrolling and making sure that their nations uh, you know, flotillas are safe and that their construction assets are safe and protected. Um, and, but I would also imagine that, uh, and I've written a recent piece on this uh, called an ICAO for the Moon, that I think the right model uh, to enable safety of commerce uh, on the civilian side in terms of standards is the International Civil Aviation Organization. That, you know, we don't have to surrender sovereignty, you know, like is proposed in the Moon Treaty, uh, you know, in the ICAO. Nations are free to adopt standards, but it promulgates standards. They have a very uh, equitable uh, membership structure in how it's decided. And it's been extremely successful in providing a truly, you know, I mean, the scale of air commerce compared to, you know, space launch is ast just astoundingly larger, you know probably a million plus times larger. And so, you know, I think that it's time to start thinking about an, an ICAO for space. I don't, I don't really see the possibility of, uh, of nations sort of agglomerating into, you know, one, uh, one supranational organization. But, but you certainly could imagine, you know, specific zones of space traffic management and commerce uh, and I would imagine something very similar, you know, uh, you know, listeners who may be familiar with how air traffic is managed across the North Atlantic, there are these North Atlantic tracks that are, are constituted by a very specific international agreement, and you're not even allowed on that unless you have very specific uh, um, navigational capabilities, uh, communication capabilities. And so I can imagine something like that emerging in low Earth orbit in particular, where like, don't even think about applying to the ITU for a mega constellation if you don't have, you know, traffic collision and avoidance system. You know, if you don't have a transponder system. You know, if you if you're not able to see and avoid for yourself. If you don't have this level of precision of, of navigation and timing. So, I do think that there is a way forward on this. And, and like I say, I think ICAO is the right model to start this conversation. Yeah, I think Peter's covered a lot, but I, w I would point out that, so I teach a course at the Arizona State University in collaboration with Kevin O'Connell, who was the former uh, secretary of the Office of Space Commerce. And I think uh, both of us kind of think that uh, co commercial companies, when they would be involved in this kind of activity, would actually want space traffic management because that would lead to predictability and uh, very clear uh, ability to earn profit. So, but the danger 
and this is what I think uh, is really critical, that the activity might happen and then the regulation might follow, right? And so once you have that kind of crowding, you already have it with Starlink. Already there is a huge, uh, you know, disagreement and uh, scramble for low Earth orbit bandwidth because there is nobody to actually uh, regulate it and it's first come first serve. So I think that's my concern, that the nation with the most ability will get there. And you know, there are very few spacefaring nations that actually have the ability to do the things we are talking about. And then they would basically dominate. And, then, and so I think the time is now to think about these particular important uh, space traffic management rules. I think it's a really critical question. Your book is absolutely fascinating, and this discussion has been truly wonderful. Uh, to close, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, I think I have two final thoughts. Uh, the first fun thought, uh, which comes from the book and my engagement, and I always uh, think it's important to state it, that the uh, world we live today is not the Cold War. Uh, there are 72 nations with space agencies with very, very strong ambitions to become spacefaring and to make sure that space benefits them economically. And I think that particular reality has to be recognized. And that is why our book has relevance today, because it kind of builds that picture, including in our conclusion, where we talk about the different scenarios and different countries building into that influence structure. I think the second uh, lesson is that uh, it is not really clear uh, if the U.S. will maintain leadership because for any policy leadership position that you want to maintain in the next 20 years, the uh, decision is today because you have to invest in uh, human uh, thinking, you have to invest in technology, you have to invest in building partnerships, it takes time. And because the U.S. is not actually rising up to that particular policy opportunity, I would say, it might actually cede leadership to a country like China in collaboration with Russia. And that's the second lesson I would like to leave your audience with. Peter. Well, I'll start with where I, be where I began, that space resources are, will matter to the future of power and that uh, nations can't afford in their vision or strategy or policy uh, not to be uh, pursuing them. And then, uh, since I assume you know most of your audience is going to be uh, national security space professionals, um, what I would say is that you're called upon to uh, think about a larger canvas. That the domain that you are the steward of is going to be, you know, important in so many ways beyond just support to the warfighter, and that it falls upon you and your generation uh, in shaping this and being able to articulate the broader value and context for space. And that uh, what will be you know, different about this generation, of, or what, is, what the calling is of this generation of national security space professionals is that they cannot think about military capabilities in a stovepipe. They have to necessarily become architects of broader national security. And that means that they necessarily have to consider the economic and industrial base uh, that they're embedded in. And they cannot expect either the, the, uh, the civil arms or the commercial arms, even if they're going to be the ones actually executing and building those capabilities, to understand and take care of national security priorities. They have to step up to being the architects of the future of uh, American security in space, including not only the, the industrial base that we have to build in space, to maintain a position of national security, as well as the nurturing of the industrial base on Earth and the you know, and the space and the ground-based space race uh, for coalitional support, and so it's very important, you know, that this generation of space professionals is very international, international partnership-minded, and is very uh, is constantly up-channeling strategic thoughts to the broader national leadership about how it needs to shape its civil program its commercial program, what technologies like advanced propulsion, like in situ resource utilization, like in space uh, servicing assembly and manufacturing need to be developed as part of the totality of the economic system that produces national power and military power. And that may be uncomfortable, it may be culturally uncomfortable to think about a much broader set of naval-like roles, to think about a much 
broader AOR, um, to think about a, a much broader mission set and a much broader responsibility set, but, uh, but that's what's going to be required you know, to sustain and, and, and prevail, and we, we, need, we need you to step up. On behalf of the NSSI, our faculty, our students and our wider space community, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and share uh, your insight on Scramble for the Science and being part of our Speak series. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us, it's an honour. Thank you so much. <laughs>